Oh, right. Bisa sekarang, Mas Patrick? Ya, silakan mulainya, Mas. Ya, yeah, oke. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Selamat siang. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Muhammad Arif Rahman. Just call me Pak Arif. I'm the Education and Culture Attaché. In the Indonesian Embassy in London. Today we are going to have a, a presentation and discussions way about Indonesian films, and we are now uh, picking up a topics called cultural contestation, which is probably a bit, I don't know, it's a difficult word or easy word, but it might be a mysterious word. Yeah, what we're going to do with this uh, contestation. Uh, we have here three speakers, uh, and then also we have a the ambassador, Pak Disra, and also Mbak Hana, the, I think he, she was preferred to be called like Indonesian actress here, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, the agenda and the program today will start with a remarks from Pak Disra, and they will be followed by uh, presentations, but this will be live by Mbak Hana. So now I'd like to start a meeting today <coughs> with remarks from Pak Disra. Thank you very much, Pa Arif, esteemed panelists, Ibu Miske Taurisia, Mas Adrian Scanlon, Ibu Dina Helena Suwarto, dan tentu saja Mbak Hana Al Rashid. Uh, dear participants, good afternoon from London and good evening in Indonesia. Welcome to our today's discussion talk on Indonesian film cultural contestation, contestation, and the future of Indonesian cinema. It is a great pleasure to meet you all, although virtually. Our discussion today, the second event on Indonesian film discussion series is organized by Indonesian Embassy in London in collaboration with the Indonesian Film Society. The previous event held uh, last December, focused on the Indonesian film industry during the pandemic, presenting prominent speakers such as Dr. Budi Irawanto, Dr. Eki Imanjaya, and Mr. Ahmad Mahendra, whom portrayed the condition of Indonesia in the times of the pandemic. Today, we will have a different focus, namely, on the cultural contestation and the future of Indonesian films. Through the insights of our prominent panelists today, and also moderated by Ibu Hana, we attempt to emphasize the future of Indonesian films in the context of diversity and various opposing cultural forces. This is very interesting theme. I do hope that our discussion today will provide a fresh insight to us all and bring a better understanding in the contemporary democratic situation in Indonesia nowadays. Wish you an inspiring and ex exciting discussion. Stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you, Parif. Thank you very much, Pak Tisla. Um, we now proceed to the uh, main agenda in the program, which is the discussion. So I'd like to invite Mbak Hana to lead the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Pak Arif. Thank you very much also to His Excellency Pak Desra as Indonesian ambassador to the UK and Ireland for your opening remarks. Um, my name is Hana Al Rashid and I'll be your moderator for today's discussion. Our discussion today is on cultural contestations and the future of Indonesian cinema. So just to remind everyone that we would love for you all to interact in this discussion as well. So we'll be having a one hour discussion with our three panelists and then a 30 minute questions and answer session. So please feel free to drop your questions in the chat box to our team. Or for those of you who are watching live from our YouTube live stream, you can drop your questions in the live chat box there. So coming on to cultural contestations, 
Well, various contestations of social identities such as religion, race, culture, and gender are increasingly shown in contemporary Indonesian films. This is evident in such titles such as Kuchumbu Tubu Indaku, Memories of My Body, Marlena, The Murderer in Four Acts, as well as Check the Kosobala, Check the Door at the Store Next Door. It's safe to say that most of the contemporary Indonesian films have played a role in bringing up, if not amplifying, the scope of discussions on all of these issues within society. So it becomes interesting to see what is in store for Indonesian cinema by taking into account social dynamics and reactions to Indonesian films. Now with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce to our amazing lineup of panelists for today's discussion. First off, we have Badina Herlina Suwarto. Uh, Badina is a PhD student in film and television studies at the University of Nottingham. Her research is related to media industry studies and audience. She's a founder of Ruma Cinema, a co-founder of Jogja Netpak Asian Film Festival, and also a co-founder of Kajian Film, uh, excuse me, sorry, Kajian Film Indonesia. Uh, welcome, Badina. And next we have, uh, who I'll call Mas, Mas Adrian Scanlon. Adrian is a London-based filmmaker and co-founder of the Indonesian Film Society. Adrian helped set up IFS with the aim of spreading Indonesian cinema to the UK and encouraging discussion on issues connected to Indonesia. And lastly, but not least, we have Mbak Meska Torisia, otherwise known as Mbak Dede. Um, Mbak Dede has worked as a film producer since 2007, and her films have been showcased at many international film festivals. In 2016, she co-founded Palari Films, a film production house based in Indonesia. And film production aside, Madede is actively involved in Indonesian independent film scenes through Collective, a distribution platform for independent films, Kinosaurus, a micro virtual cinema, and Lock Film Lab. So that's everyone for today. And let's get our discussion on cultural contestations and the future of Indonesian cinema started. To start off with, I would like to invite Mbedina to set the scene for our audience and to offer us an insight into the state of Indonesian cinema, including a bit about its history and progression over the years. Um, Mbedina, thank you and take it away. Okay, Hannah, thank you. Can you hear my voice? Yes, we can all hear you, Mbedina. Okay, I would like to share my PowerPoint. Can you see my PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank to Indonesian Embassy, uh, Education and Cultural Attaché, and Indonesian Film Society, who invited me to this delightful event. Uh, my presentation is about cultural contestation of Indonesian film in the last 10 years. First of all, I would like to briefly overview the current situation of Indonesian film industry. Then I would like to show um, some film that re re represent the cultural contestation in Indonesia. Um, lastly, I will discuss the cause of the value of rivalry. Okay, uh, for the last 20 years after 2000, Indonesia experienced the rapid development of Indonesian film industry. 2008, probably the turning point of production enlargement that steadily continue for the last 10 years. Before the pandemic, the number of film production reached the highest point in 2018 for about 146 films. Um, the most popular genres such as drama, horror, comedy successfully attracted the audience as shown by this chart. Uh, and the significant number of these films take urban setting because of cost consideration and audience preference. As the film revenue on average was relatively tight, uh, the producer avoided a risk to produce high cost films such as animation, action, or blockbuster. The gender choice also responded to the movie theater audience majority taste, which was mostly urban young people. Uh, overall, the Indonesian film industry consisted of multiple companies. Uh, big studio played the most important role here, followed by media conglomerate owned, 
uh, small and micro companies. The big film studios dominated market to produce like five until 10 films a year. Uh, although Indonesia media conglomerate established subsidiary companies to produce film, they will not control the film industry as they position in the print and television industry. The small company usually owned by young filmmakers were struggling to find strategic position in the industry. Most of them decided to follow the commercial industry to engage with the politic of the production, while the few others tried to fi find funding from international film festival or run the boat strategies. At the same time, some micros company failed to continue their production after one or two uh, films. Uh, one of the prevalent issue in Indonesian film industry is about censorship. After 2000s, censorship modified their procedure that combined censorship and rating system. They compiled the censorship standard from their raters rather than retrieve society opinion about normative values such as British Board of Film Classification, BBFC, and the Classification and Rating Administration, CARA method. Therefore, the censor committee had a legitimation to determine the good and bad values. Furthermore, uh, govern the government implemented censor law erratically for different cases. Um, Indonesian filmmakers are not only need to handle censorship, but also to uh, deal with the persecution. Uh, the radical Muslim organization often challenged the uh, censorship decision by persecuting film production, festivals, and screening, representing sexual identity, religious interpretation, and communism issues. Uh, after examining the context, I will move to the film text. Inspired by the social and cultural diversity, Indonesian films depict the cultural contestation that involves at least on youth culture, women representation, ethnic minority representation, local culture, gender diversity, religion, and political issues. As you can see in my slide, there are some of the uh, uh, youth uh, films. Uh, the youth culture in the films described in various ways, such as young people who live in the Pondok Pesantren in film like uh, Negeri Lima Menara, uh, Islamic boarding house teenagers, or the rebellious teenager in the Dilan, it's more, the most popular uh, youth film, I think, until uh, some of the movies also open discussion about uh, taboo issues like a sex before marriage, body shaming, and mental health. Uh, in align with the youth culture, women also depict in different ways. Polygamy, sexual intimidation, and harassment are the main problems of this, these women characters. They find solution based on their value. They can be accept, uh, negotiate, or radically against the oppressor. Uh, in some extents, Indonesian film industry also give a space for local and ethnic minority representation. Although most of this film deliver in the culture in the popular ways, uh, like a uh, Cek Toko Sebelah, it's very popular. Um, this film provide alternative point of view to see Indonesian uh, society. See, like a uh, Yo West Band, it's quite popular also in Indonesia. Uh, all the story are spoken in a Javanese, West Javan, sorry, East Javanese language. <clears throat> Many religious team films were produced after 2000s. Movies set in Islamic religion are the most popular. The phenomena represent the Islamic power among Indonesian society. Furthermore, Indonesian film industry express a variety of Islam ideology, such as, such as conservative, moderate and liberal. The existence of other religion in the film scene need to notice since they are under censorship and persecution. The film director Sugiya uh, revealed that he was intimidated while producing the film about uh, 
about the Catholic leader, <clears throat> while the sin of Mariam, who converting Islam, sorry, who converting from Islam to Catholic, was censored. So religious team is uh, often invite controversial discussion. Among many, gender diversity are known as LGBT issue, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender are the most rare topic since censorship blatantly mentioned about this issue in their regulation. Furthermore, this subject often invite persecution. In this film, the LGBT issue are presented in subtle ways as a part of human relationship conflict. Uh, similar, with the, similar with the previous issue, politics issue also is considered as problematic for some reason. Therefore, the film producer often focus on biography of political figures rather than deeply explore the political problems. However, the biographical narrative delicately review the politician point of view about society and nation. In my opinion, the contestation of various cultural, political, religion, and sexual identities through film represent the values rivalry in Indonesia. Because after authoritarian era, different ideology are uh, contested to gain power. However, until now, there is no absolute power that are able to substitute the authoritarian doctrine. To some extent, the censor regulate the contestation and prosecutors commit violence to win the contestation. Uh, all the film that I discuss above are distributed in the mainstream channel, such as movie theaters. Another arena for film distribution, distribution like alternative channels, such as special screening, micro cinema, and film festival are not discussed in, in my presentation. I believe in the side stream channel, the cultural contestation is more obvious since censorship is not exist and the persecution can be avoided. Moreover, the audience is more uh, fragmented. So overall, I would say that film, Indonesian film industry is represent the cultural contestation uh, uh, in, in their text as well and uh, the values that we contested in our society. Thank you, Mbahana. Thank you, Mbak Dina, for that insightful recap and introduction to Indonesian cinema. Um, from these slides, I guess we can see that there is definitely potential for growth, for amazing growth in the Indonesian film industry, and also that for a country as diverse as Indonesia, all of these diversities are reflected in its films. They reflect the various cultures, the various uh, religions, ethnic layers of Indonesian society and films often do become a way for us to learn about other countries. So bringing on that point, before we go to Mbak Meisko, Mbak Dede, who is a filmmaker on the ground, I wanted to ask Adrian, as um, a co-founder of IFS, who brings Indonesian films to UK audiences, are you able to share with us what in general do your audiences in the UK know of Indonesian cinema? Uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a, an interesting question because, um, yeah, it's uh, a lot of our, our audience members uh, or pre-pandemic when we had the actual live screenings. Uh, Indonesia was uh, a mixture of uh, both a, a country which uh, they were either fond of having, you know, spent some time there before or actually knew very little about. So there's the, the old joke here that, uh, a lot of people uh, sort of have heard of Bali, but not Indonesia. Uh, so uh, that that can uh, uh, happen quite a bit. But um, yeah, uh, with our screenings, uh, you know, it, it does sort of, uh, you know, people do tend to leave afterwards knowing a, a bit more. Brilliant. Thank you. So now that we know a little bit about um, what UK audiences understand of Indonesia and this very in-depth look that Madina has just given us, um, I think I'd like to turn to Mbak Dede. Um, as an Indonesian filmmaker who is living and breathing film in Jakarta particularly, and based on what Madina has just shared with all of us, how easy or how difficult, I guess it depends how you see it, how easy or how difficult is it to be a, film in, a filmmaker in Indonesia with the current social political climate? 
Ya, yeah, uh, thanks Sana and uh, thank you Mbak Dina for the insight on on the statistic especially. I think if we look at Mbak Dina's uh, statistic, we can see that the number is getting more and more. So I would say that, uh, you know, it's, it's getting better and easier than to make film in Indonesia. Um, the number of audience is, is so much, you know, uh, better now. Although like, I would say that we are actually now quite on the highest, uh, kind of like the peak. And suddenly like 2020 with the pandemic, it's really crushed uh, the number of the audience. So that's the, the, the sad part of the, of the pandemic as, as a filmmakers. Uh, but yeah, going back to your questions, I think, uh, I think the technology play uh, a lot of, you know, uh, help then it, it's a big help for, for filmmakers. I mean, with the professional one, the one that lives in the big cities, they have the rental equipment uh, facility uh, to, to make films. But then uh, on the other part of Indonesia, where they, where they don't have the, the rental equipment, for example, they, they can use whatever you know technology that they have to make films. So in that sense, I think uh, you know it's you know it's it's going very good then. Although going back to the numbers of Madina, as, as Madina mentioned that these numbers are the one that screen in the big screen. But I think I remember Wang Panai, one of the film like from Makassar. Makassar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the poster you put there in the, in the presentation with Madina. I think that's one of the example that uh, the advantage of, uh, you know, having the technology then in Makassar, I don't think they have like a big equipment rental, but then the spirit, you know, the, 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 they, they, they you know, as long as they have the spirit to make the film, then they are able to do it. And as far as I remember, the numbers are really good. Excellent. Yeah, I think Wang Panai got about 400,000 uh, ticket sales, if I'm not mistaken, when it came out. And it showed how much so that I think in a lot of regions that are perhaps less represented Yes. in TV or in film, there is a market to see yeah. your own local culture. So that brings me on to my next question. Um, of course, Indonesia is undoubtedly rich in local culture, but how do you think these cultures are represented or how are they being represented in films uh, these days, especially with minority cultures? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, this is a, a very important question. And I find, you know, like having this question, I think it makes me think like we have to see it on a different way and different level. For example, if we talk about, you know, the 146 films that is produced like the past two years, for example, and this year 130 something, I would say that, you know, this film uh, uh, predominantly, you know, catering the issue of um, middle class, uh, as Badina said, urban issues, mostly on big cities. And I think we have to see and we have to go back through to the filmmakers. And if we, if we notice, if we look deeper that the spread of the, the filmmakers in Indonesia is not equal. You know, mostly the production houses, the filmmakers, they are mostly like, I would say from those uh, numbers, 80% are based in Jakarta probably 10% are based in Yogyakarta, and then the rest of 10%, 10 scattered around Indonesia. So I think in terms of, you know, where do they live, like these filmmakers, I think it contributes to, you know, what kind of films that are, that, are, that is produced then with these numbers. And, you know, and as a filmmakers, usually you start, uh, I mean, I'm from Dina's uh, description, I'm part of the micro uh, company, you know, I produce one or two, films in two years. Uh, so, I mean, as a filmmaker in this area, I will always start, you know, to find story that, you know, within myself or even like within my circle, for example. So I think uh, in that sense, you know, if filmmakers, uh, you know, in the beginning of their creation starting like that, started like that, that means the, 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 the films produced are pretty much, you know, they have, they do have this awareness of, you know, cultural aspect of it, but then it's really, you know, within their, within their area. So I think, okay. um, I think uh, from, from that perspective, it is really, I mean, for me, this issue of cultural aspect and minority with the ethnicity, gender, it is a structural problem in Indonesia. For example, if we have more film, if we have more universities that have 
major for film production, for example. Then the idea of, of their cultural from every part of Indonesia, then it can be represented, represented then in, 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 the, in the landscape. But at this moment, I would say that it's not yet represented because majority we are in Jakarta and Yogyakarta. So from that perspective, I think this idea of you know putting or inserting cultural aspects such as you know the minority issue like women, gender, ethnicity, it it's pretty much relies on individual awareness of the filmmakers, and it's really tough because I mean it it is that that means we as as filmmakers we have this responsibility, which it should not be our responsibility actually. I mean. We, we have the awareness, we have to expose ourselves to what's going on up there, out there. But if the structure is not supporting, how far can you go? So yeah. I think a structural, you know, something with the structure of the education of film itself, if not education of film in formal way, but at least in informal way, such as film festival. But again, film festival is only like, you know, a handful of them, you know? So from this pers perspective, I think, uh, we we cannot rely on the you know we cannot expect the filmmakers to to fulfill all this expectation of you know catering the minority when you know 150 films are not all of them produced by you know small companies like myself you know yeah. as a filmmakers we can insert that in our film in whatever way because we have the setting we design the characters. You know, we insert the music there. So we can do that, actually. If we are, you know, spread equally across Indonesia, I think that, that the, control, the cultural contestation that Madina mentioned uh, in the slide, that, is, that would be even stronger. Uh, the, the presence will be even stronger then in the landscape. Thank you, Madede. This becomes something quite interesting because, of course, you know, um, uh, I mean, up until six months ago, I was working as an actress in Jakarta for 12 years. And I've always been a fan of Indonesian cinema and observing how, with what Badina mentioned about this idea of boycotts of films or this idea of there are taboo issues and this idea that sometimes filmmakers are not free to actually create as openly as they would like about particular subjects or about particular issues. So coming back to what um, Badina mentioned, about these kind of examples. For example, I know that before Dua Garis Biru had even been released, there were already protests and petitions to have it not released. And then when Garin's film, Memories of My Body came out, that also created a whole other palava. So as a film producer, do you see an opportunity in producing films on issues that people still consider taboo? Is it something that you consciously think, okay, let's do it, or is that more, do you think are you, are you then thinking more about a potential backlash that could happen when you are starting your projects? Hello? By the you're, you're on mute. Kedengeran uh, tadi? Okay. Uh, now, oh, yeah, now we can hear you, my daddy. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think this censorship is, you know, as uh, I agree with Madina when, you know, you have this cultural contestation, but then you have the censorship to regulate it. I think that's already a conflict within it. I mean, uh, how how do you have, uh, you know, how do you have this idea of uh, of, you know. Uh, expressing you know the minority uh, issues in a film when a censorship regulates it i'm not saying that we don't need a well i would say that i don't need a censorship i mean that's a, a, a censorship itself already need to be upgraded you know the word censorship i think i don't think it, it applies you know these days you have to you have to you know update your organization into a film classification for example so I think, and this is already a, a very, you know, uh, an issue that has been going on for years. I think every 10 years, there will be, you know, a movement to, to say something about this. So I think this is an ongoing discussion. I mean, it's not a discussion, actually. It's just an ongoing, you know, uh, protest from the filmmakers, but it's just never happened. But I think it goes back to the idea of, you know, how this censorship 
how they they intend to regulate this uh, film because uh, you know we have to look back at the history of censorship i mean censorship was uh, established during the dutch it was re and 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 the law is basically based on that as as many other laws in indonesia based on the dutch so it really um, you know a very you know outdated perspective to see a film like that i always think that even classification that they say 17 plus we know even our our ktp is 18 plus that's already not match you know you have i mean like 17 it's still considered minor so you have at least to change into 18 plus uh with with the censorship so i think uh they need to rethink about themselves i mean we are no longer in the era that film is a propaganda film is not under a, an, an information or communication ministry we are yeah. not you know we are we are not that i mean we are under a cultural uh, ministry so yes. we have to see from that perspective but i can see the the dilemma because censorship itself is under the ministry of education and and cultural so i think i mean we can already see this perspective perspective is you know uh how do you say conflicting within its own body Okay. So I mean, as a filmmakers, of course, I mean, I, I'm always sure that that I will do something and I will, you know, put something because I believe. I mean, I always have have something on my mind, and and when I make film, it's a way for me to express my, how do you say, uh, something that bothers me, you know, yeah. then put it in film in whatever way, in the yeah. character, in the setting, for example, in the conflict, in the background even in the noises when when the characters you know hear something from the neighbors for example we can always put that but then how this regulation then you know like for example if when i make uh, when we make the film aruna and her palette we have you as the character not, you know <laughs> hannah played not you know and we 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 want to have this character is a, a modern like contemporary indonesian but when she said something about condom. It always already it, it already feel very sensitive to the censorship, you know. And then we we don't show anything. We just say that you know. Use like, a condom yeah, is my line. <laughs> you, you probably remember the line. I yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then, but then it, it becomes very sensitive. But I mean, like everyone should know what is the function of condom. So like, you know, if we want to prevent something in Indonesia, then you have to be, you know, and then I think that's something that is always uh, an issue in Indonesia with the censorship. I think as much as they want to sustain, but I think they, they have to really think about their position, even the composition of the board, for example. I, I, I remember because in 2015, I did a documentary about censorship. And I know that at that time, the the if you are in the in the board of the censorship, one of them is how do you how do you say it in English? Pertahanan keamanan. Um, defense. Yes. Maintaining defense or yeah. safety. Yeah. There there must be a representation from Hankam. There must be a representation from Bin. How do you say Bin? Oh, Bin is like Badan Intelligence Negara, yeah. 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 Like the. Uh, what would the English equivalent be? Yeah, the intelligence body, formal intelligence government body. Yeah. So oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, those, I mean, uh, then you can see the politics of censorship. Okay. I think, but I, I did not know as well about that. Sorry, someone's just added in state intelligence agency. Thank you very much, Bruce. Thank you. <laughs> you come in for that. Thank you very much. But I think I'm, I know that Badina has a lot to say about censorship, but there's something that I just want to bring Badina back into this conversation as well, because before we move on to censorship, there's something that Badina mentioned about propaganda. <laughs> And this is something that I have found quite interesting, maybe not so much an overt propaganda, but definitely pushing particular aspects of social life within films in Indonesia. And this is something as, as a woman and as a, you know, as a woman living in Indonesia, as of Indonesian blood, I've noticed this. When you watch particular films and there's this idea of how a good woman should be or good values that we should have. And these good values and good women often are very always portrayed with the majority religion. And so I think I wanted to ask Mbaedina, what is the trend of religious themes, religious themed films in Indonesia? And 
is there actually a higher audience demand for religious themed films? Or is this a kind of product of increased investment from investors who have, you know, an interest in promoting particular issues or particular social ideals? Um, <clears throat> I think by statistic, the number of Islamic films uh, is decreased uh, compared to the last decade. However, the way uh, women represent in this Islamic uh, films is more varied, like I mentioned before. For example, the in the uh, film uh, Ma, Ma that I uh, show you before, the, she experienced polygamy also, but uh, she decided not to follow his husband obediently. She decided to um, to live in the spirit house of uh, her husband, and she tried to be independent in in economically, for example, like that. Uh, however, in many films, especially for love story films, they still uh, have like um, woman character who accept polygamy. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's polygamy actually. Uh, one of the most problematic <laughs> issues in Indonesian uh, Islamic uh, movie uh, compared to other issues such as um, ideology and so on. However, uh, we can see in our society now in Indonesia, the conservative uh, Islam is uh, get more support, bigger and bigger than previous decade or, or, or uh, before 2000s. So yeah, I think to some extent the film uh, describe the society, but also uh, give alternative narrative of uh, Islam. I see, okay. And so um, saying that, I'm quite curious now because we've, so we've kind of brushed on various different genres of Indonesian films and different ones that are popular for different, I mean, there's in Indonesia, there's a film for everyone, basically. If you're a horror fan, there's that. If you want something that's more religious, there's that. If you want just something fun and brainless, there's that as well. We have some amazing films where you can just laugh your head off without having to think too much about it. And then we have films where you have to really think hard <laughs> when watching them. So I'd like to bring Adrian in now. As someone who, you know, who's a filmmaker based in the UK, but also someone who brings Indonesian films to the UK audience. What kind of Indonesian films, like which of these genres are actually most popular to UK audiences in your, in your observation? Uh, well, we, uh, we try, we basically, we, we try different things, um, you know, from documentaries to, you know, uh, more sort of serious dramas, uh, sort of, uh, we, we showed uh, Duat Garaspiro uh, as well uh, recently. So um, yeah, we, we try to do like a, a variety just because as you say there's so much you know different types of films there which there there is an interest in but um, I was just uh, sort of interested listening to what you guys were you know saying earlier where uh, you know something that I found quite interesting was um, yeah in terms of like um, you know certain things that you, you can and can't show uh, within in Indonesian films it's quite interesting because you know within Indonesia you know they will uh, have access to non-Indonesian films, you know, which perhaps have a bit more, you know, license to, you know, do some of the things that, you know, perhaps that the likes of Imbat Dede would like to do, you know, a bit more freely. And I think it's it, it, it sometimes boils down to it kind of being okay, as long as that behavior is done by the other, if that makes sense. And so even within Indonesian films, uh, you know, something that I've sort of noticed is sometimes what can happen and tying into, you know, the whole sort of minorities within Indonesia, you know, uh, strand is sometimes when there is sort of, uh, you know, sort of, for want of a better word, sinful action displayed, it, it would be uh, by uh, like a non-Islamic uh, character, for example. So again, it's sort of tying into it's it's them doing it, but not us. So, you know, that's, you know, quite interesting. But um, yeah, in terms of, you know, uh, showing Indonesian films uh, abroad, I guess, you know, what, you know, we try to do, and I guess, you know, fest various festivals uh, around the world do, is sort of offer this kind of safe space so that you can, you know, show your films in it, their entirety, you know, so that, 
you know, you can, you're free to, you know, make the films that you want to make ultimately. But I guess it's important at the same time that we're only, you know, part of the answer rather than, you know, the full solution, because, you know, I, I would uh, assume that you would want, you know, your, your films to be like that and screened, you know, as, as you envisioned them sort of everywhere. Yeah. But, you know, but Dede, would you like to jump in at uh, Adrian's observation about the fact that it's okay when someone else does it? I do, but that's exactly uh, the, uh, what the, I mean, like I did this documentary on censorship 2015, uh, title Potongan, cut, we call it, uh, the title. And that's exactly what the censor person uh, mentioned to me when, when we are having this discussion. I, I mean, I, I, at that time we discussed, like we, we mentioned a title, an American title. Why is that film is okay to have, you know, you see some part of the body, but then not to Indonesian film. And that's, that's exactly what they say because they're not us. Wow. You know? So then what do you expect us then to, you know, to, to, what do you expect us to, you know, from the, what, what, what do I have to expect from them then if, if, if their answer like that? I mean, I'm okay to say this because he's no longer in the censorship board. I think I mean, it's already like 2015. So, I mean, he's gone probably or he's there. I don't know. But anyway, it's the way they answer is, you know, then, you know, how, how do you actually, you know, have these filters then when, when you do a censor, if, you, if your answer is like that? Yeah. And how can we trust you then for, a, for an answer like that? Yeah. Maybe, Baidina, are you, are you able to offer perhaps some more depth and insight into this censorship board and how it is, how it is built and what, what is the legal basis behind the censorship board and how it operates, perhaps? Yeah. Um, as Mbak Dede said before, the, the assumption behind the censorship is the state is more clever than the ordinary people. So they need to, they have a right, they have power to uh, determine the good and the bad values for the people. Um, and in many cases in the world, actually, uh, the intention to protect the minors, teenagers and children also become the consideration of censorship. So, that's why that's why they um, try to formulate a censorship in the right way. I mean, in the fair way, as I uh, mentioned before, the the British style and the American style try to adopt uh, the common common opinion, the people opinion about something about the values. It's not based on some people, uh, some or certain group opinion only. And I had a story, it's related to Mbak Ma Dede uh, experience also. In 2015, in Yogyakarta, I was invited by the censorship uh, committee. They want to have a uh, badan sensor daerah, regional, uh, sorry, province uh, sensor uh, body. And at that time, they mentioned uh, frequently that they want to develop local film, Yogyakarta local film, by censorship. I don't get it, how? <laughs> we need financial incentive. Maybe the local films needs um, like a, a bank, bank loan or a capital or a human resource development and anything, but not censorship, I think. So we have enough when, of that. <laughs> <laughs> when most of the audience rejected that idea, they said, like, we have some of opportunity to work for you. So what's what's the point then? You do you do you want to provide work for the filmmakers to be censored uh, committee or anything else? And I think uh, after several uh, struggle from the filmmakers all over the Indonesia, I think, and until now the Baden Sensor Daerah, the province censorship, is uh, is not established anywhere. I think. Okay. Yeah, they don't want to establish in in Surabaya, but I don't think they are effective. No. But it's okay. good, to hear, good to hear that, Madina, because I also remember at that around that year, they have this, you know, tagline of self-censorship. They want to go to filmmakers and 
do self censorship and what they expect is when you write a script you already have to think about the censorship but i think that's that's not good for our creativity well no exactly yeah, yeah. How, how, how do you expect to develop your creativity your idea as a creator when you already i mean and i and i met filmmaker from palu for example uh, from sulawesi and he mentioned that you know i mean when he writes a script he already think about if this is will be cut by the censorship then i better <laughs> rewrite it you know i just put the safe one so i mean so it won't get cut later i i mean i don't think that's healthy yeah well i mean that brings me on to my next question but did as a filmmaker how do you handle this the effects of censorship in your own projects and how does it affect your work how does it affect your audience numbers maybe mm -hmm. you can provide some examples for us well i think um yeah we we just have to try to think you know uh, I, i mean i really don't know how i mean like i mean i always think that when we want to make a film uh we have to really think about uh you know why why we need that scene and that scene probably included the the sensitive you know issue with minority for example and you know ethnic gender or whatever and i think oh, what we do is really to 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 show you know um the conflict then as a human you know as a human you have the right you know you have every rights for everything but how it develops into conflict when it gets to a relationship within with, with your neighbors for example or with your partners for example or with the family for example so i think the perspective of having this conflict in like this conflict internally and then have a human conflict is always i think that's also the reason why it, it gets more into drama than the serious one Uh, but with Czech Talk Osbla, I mean, I love Czech Talk Osbla, Czech Talk Osbla because I'm Chinese and I think I don't see a lot of like how the Chinese, you know, laugh at themselves. So I really like film like Czech Talk Osbla, you know, they talk ethnicity. So I think between between a serious drama and into comedy, I think, you know, then you can play uh, with this. And for me personally, I mean, I always think because this is always my struggle as a producer. If my film got censored, how 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 do I respond to them? For example, I always think that probably the best way is to to also let the audience know that this film is censored. Just just keep the censor part. How do you want it to be? Is it black screen or is it blur? I'll do that for you, so they know that it, it is cut because of the censors. So I think I think that's the most that that I can do so far. Okay, I see. And how does it work? Because of course, a lot of your films have you've been, you've worked on a lot of projects that have gone to international film festivals. And maybe Adrian, you can add uh, add some insight on this. But I'm pretty sure that when it comes to showcasing your films outside of Indonesia, there shouldn't be any problems in terms of censorship. You have you have a lot more free reign to to go to go crazy, if you will. So when you're producing or when you're making films. I feel like a lot of films in Indonesia, when people are making their films, they already know where their audience is. We kind of know, okay, this is going to be catered to the international festivals. Mm -hmm. And if we get limited screening in Indonesia, that'll be yeah. good. But we know our focus isn't that. And then there are some where they're completely dependent on the domestic market and therefore they cater it very specifically to that. How does this work as well when, when you're making films? Are these the kind of things that you think about? Yeah, of course, of course. I mean, I try my best not to make two cuts, two versions, for example. Uh, but I don't know in the future. Like so far, I haven't made any two version of my films, so it's always the same. Uh, the one that travel to international, and the one uh, who also screen at home. Um, I mean, the consequences from the censorship probably about. The age classification. Then, if I intended to be 13 plus, but then it becomes 17 plus, or I intended to be 17 plus, but then it becomes 21 plus. I mean, um, yeah. I mean, I, I like that's the most that uh, you know I can I can do. I mean, I will try my best to negotiate, of course, with them. But then uh, it depends on the scenes. Then, so I um, yeah, it's really uh, specific on specific film. Okay. Adrian, do you have any anything to add? Um, 
Not, not really. I mean, uh, we will only censor films if they criticise the Indonesian Film Society. Um, no, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, uh, we, <laughs> no, we, we, as I say, we just try to create, a, you know, a safe and comfortable space so that filmmakers, you know, uh, who we're fortunate to work with, you know, they can, you know, screen uh, what they sort of want to screen. And I guess the only thing is if that, you know, film has any sort of mature, you know, content, then we just forewarn, you know, the audience beforehand and just try to keep it like that really as, as simple as possible. Okay, brilliant. I've just been informed we have 15 minutes left on this discussion. So I'd like to remind everyone, if you have any questions, you can uh, drop them in the chat box or if you're watching live, from YouTube, you can also drop your questions in the uh, chat box there. And um, I want to move on to the future of Indonesian cinema. And of course, this pandemic has greatly affected the film industry. And I believe that that has already been discussed in the previous talk that was organized by the Indonesian embassy. So um, from what I'm aware, um, I know that up until today, Indonesian cinemas are still not fully, uh, still not open to full capacity and that a lot of films have been, um, their release dates have been postponed. But this has also coincided with a lot more online OTT content, particularly series. So I wanna ask um, um, Mbak Dede, firstly, how, how has this affected the way in, you, in which you work or the way in which you, you're gonna have future projects? What challenges are you facing currently because of the pandemic? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, with the series, uh, with the OTT now, we can see like a lot of series, uh, I mean, coming. And I think as a filmmaker, I mean, I'm not used to making a series, for example. So I think this is one of the big challenges for me during the pandemic, the pandemic that uh, what should we do then? And uh, how do we develop ourselves? How do we upgrade our skills then into making series, for example? Uh, although I still hope that film will you know will be back to its normal situation which whatever normal is that that will be but i do believe that film still has its position but then we have to uh, we have to uh, we have to be real that uh, like for example myself then i really have to learn then for example to make series because then the ott is really running based on series Okay, so there's a lot of adapting that has to take place. How about um, Adrian? How is the pandemic affecting IFS and your screenings? And if if the kind of general pattern is that things are moving more towards series content, how do you think that this will will this will impact IFS in future with perhaps you know less feature films to offer or at least contemporary ones to offer? Sure. Yeah, I think it's actually the same answer for both questions, uh, essentially. I mean, I think if, uh, you know, there's one thing that the past year has kind of uh, taught us is that, you know, you, you need to be flexible, uh, you need to adjust with the times as well. Uh, so in terms of how we've sort of uh, responded to it, you know, we have uh, shifted from no uh, real online events to, you know, holding quite a few in the past year or so. Um, which in itself presents its own sort of uh, opportunities and challenges. But um, yeah, it's, it, in terms of uh, sort of online series, ultimately, you know, uh, what we sort of aim to do is, as well as, you know, entertain people, you know, from watching a, a good film, is also to, you know, encourage the, uh, the discussion afterwards, because the films are usually, well, often the sort of starting point to a wider discussion on whatever topic it, you know, it, it might address. And so, you know, if uh, things sort of transition towards, you know, less and less films being made and, you know, more series uh, being the alternative, but still, you know, highlighting and bringing to the forefront, you know, these issues, then it's something that, you know, we... I guess we wouldn't really be able to, you know, ignore. But yeah, the only thing that I would sort of say just, you know, to, you know, uh, go along with that is, you know, at the same time, you know, I think it would uh, also depend on, you know, how they, you know, how they're done, because yeah, at the end of the day, you do want, I guess, it, you know, uh, a certain amount of, you know, quality as well is important because, you know, uh, at the moment with, uh, you know, series uh, in Indonesia uh, for, you know, more traditional media like television, for example, you know, there are uh, a number of shows and I've actually been on set, you know, of one or two where literally the 
the model is um, you know you'll get a script finalized basically the morning of a shoot and then you'll have one day to film and edit you know one hour's worth of programming you know with uh, you know a whole you know a load of you know rushing basically and you know that can you know uh, have naturally have like a, a bit of an impact on you know quality so I guess it depends on how it was done but I'm sure if you know people like uh, Imbat Dede are involved then that won't be a problem. Smart. <laughs> so have have IFS um have you kind of moved to online uh screenings now? We have, yes. Yeah. So before the pandemic, it was all done, you know, uh, at a venue, essentially a, a cinema uh, screening. But uh, we have been doing uh, you know, we've done a few uh, online uh, film screenings, followed by, you know, a discussion similar to what we're doing now. And yeah, well, it's actually, you know, presented um, unique uh, sort of opportunities that we didn't really have before. So before, you know, we were limited to basically people who were in London, you know, within a certain time frame on a Saturday or a Sunday, whenever we were holding it. But now there's a lot more flexibility so that, you know, people from not only across the UK, but literally across the world uh, can tune in. Uh, you know, we've had uh, viewers from, you know, places like New York, for example, across Asia, Indonesia as well, um, which wouldn't have been possible, you know, previously. So it's a bit of a win-win because, you know, the filmmakers work is ultimately shown to more people, uh, including going back to what we were saying earlier, the sort of Indonesian market where, you know, sometimes it, 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 there can be, uh, you know, problems there. So it also, uh, you know, allows for things like uh, panel discussions with the actual filmmakers as well, which again, previously would have been a, a bit difficult so yeah it, it, it definitely brings uh, unique opportunities for sure brilliant um but dina uh i was wondering if you could perhaps maybe offer some insight i know you've got some some more slides prepared but um how does the industry move on from this how do we move on from this pandemic um. <clears throat> I think the government need to be, play a pivotal role to help all the industry, not only film industry, but any kind of industry, of course. But the most important thing is the uh, Indonesian government need to establish um, what I call it as a systematic uh, uh, plan to improve this, uh, this industry. It's not only sporadic program like they done uh, until now like a, a, a like a blueprint how to improve uh, uh, Indonesian films because we have a potency but we we cannot um, uh, we cannot concrete the potency into something beneficial if we can we we don't have any uh, major intervention in terms of financial in terms of human resources and also networking access and anything okay thank you and maybe just before we get on to the Q&A session, perhaps a last question for all of you to answer. What do you identify as the opportunities for Indonesian cinema? And how are you exploiting these opportunities and how are you tackling the challenges? Maybe we can start with Baidede. Uh, for the future, I think, uh, yeah, I think with all the discussion that we're having, like, discussing about cultural, about, uh, you know, uh, issues of minority. I still think that this is very important and I'm not, you know, uh, as much as we, uh, as a filmmakers, you feel, um, how do you say, it? you feel like it's an obstacle, but actually it is part of the contemporary of Indonesia. And I think we are, you know, in, 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 in the, you know, in the period of that. So I think as much as it's, is it difficult, I think it is something that we have to keep on, you know, contesting then, as Marina said, that uh, this is something that we as, you know, we are part of the contemporary Indonesian for, for filmmakers. So I think that's our challenge for the future, like in terms of the content, in terms of the topic, in terms of the ideas as a creator. At the same time, uh, with this pandemic for the future, it is true that I mean, I remember in the beginning of pandemic, we as filmmakers, we re we received a lot of questionnaire about what is your what is your problem? Is it in the preparation? Is it in the releasing of film? You know, 
how much how big is your crew and you know all this question but i never really get something concrete out of it you know okay. we have like i think 10 questionnaire but it never really has a result and i agree that at this moment i think government intervention is something that we really need to help the industry because especially our industry is you know it's not uh it's not uh how do you say it uh we are in the entertainment business. Let's put it that way. But then if it's an entertainment business, does my profession not important? Mm. So. Yeah. Thank you, my Dede. Um, how about Adrian? Yeah, I think it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a tough question in some ways, but also a, a, an easy one. Like in terms of uh, what Mbak Dede was saying about you know government intervention, I think, it, it would be good, you know, to almost strike while the iron's hot, you know, because there is a, an interest in Indonesian cinema, you know, beyond Indonesia. And, you know, I think that there is potential there to sort of, you know, maximize that and, you know, see what can happen. I mean, it happened in South Korea and, you know, you only need to look at last year's Oscars ceremony to see the successes that that can have. Um, but yeah, in terms of sort of filmmaking, film screenings uh, I think it is actually quite an exciting time you know for you know talent to emerge basically and because it's you know it's it's never really been easier to make a film you know you, you only need to look at films like Tangerine for example all shot on a, a mobile phone and you, know, and you know film screenings even you know if you hold them online you don't necessarily need to book you know uh uh, an actual live venue so there's multiple different ways to make films to get them shown across the world you know as it, you know we've all been showing so just keep doing more and more of that brilliant and back dina um yeah in my opinion overall the cultural contestation will be continue and more fragmented because of distribution channel will be increasingly uh, increasingly varied like ott social media and so on so the audience the distribution channel will be fragmented the audience will be fragmented so they need uh, like a cultural identity that match with uh, their identity so and i think the government needs to construct a film policy that encourages local film production and films with local culture values that may be interested, uh, interest, interesting for the foreigners also. Okay, brilliant. Well, thank you very much to everyone. And with that, I think we'll get on to the questions, uh, a Q&A session, the question and answer session. Um, so I've got some that the team have sent me. We have a question from Andrea. How can we, as the general public, engage or show our support on revolutionizing the censorship? Is there anything that we can do? Maybe this is for Mbak Dede or Mbak Dina. Please write to the censorship board. <laughs> okay. No, but I think like, I think like at this moment, I think like with media, I think media, media can have like you know a big role on that so i mean i think yeah when you write something academically or you know popular you know whatever writing like just question about having a question about that i think that's already you know a help then for for everyone in here okay but dina would you like to add something i think i totally agree with my dina <laughs> <laughs> okay I think it's a great question it shows that there's support at least amongst this group of people love it yes, please. <laughs> right the next question we have is from Hartio film is considered as one of the important aspects of a country's soft power the reason the UK is among the top three with regard to soft power diplomacy I think this is from Kabir Ina what can Indonesia learn from the success of the UK Maybe Adrian, would you like to take that one, perhaps? Yeah, I'll uh, I'll become the spokesperson for the the whole of the UK's. Uh, yes. Yeah, why not? History. Yeah, Colindale. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, I mean, as broad as it sounds, and you know, it keeps uh, coming back to the the whole censorship debate. Is you know that there there isn't really a huge amount you know uh of censorship that i'm aware of really uh, going on you know for a, a while now now I, I know back in the 70s uh you know 
there were like a, a couple of you know films which you know did receive some attention but it's it's generally sort of a few, quite few and far between so I think what that does is it kind of allows you know breathing room you know to, to not work you know with you know any chains on essentially so yeah it's um if, the, if there's a, if that's one bit of advice I'd say is just to allow uh, you know filmmaking talent to you know express themselves freely as freely as possible. Mantap. <laughs> Thank you Adrian. Okay I've got a question from Erin who's watching from YouTube so shout out to the YouTube audience as well. Thank you for joining us. Um, in addition to the importance of cultural introspection that films can provide I was wondering how much Indonesians see film as a vehicle to showcase the country's diversity to the wider world. Mbak Dina or Mbak Dede, perhaps? Uh, maybe I can share my experience. Before I came to this discussion, I presented this topic to, to group academia. The first, uh, our PhD student in my campus in University of Nottingham. And the second is the PhD, uh, the PhD student of films uh, in, a, in a conference in Birmingham University. Uh, most of the audience uh, don't know about Indonesian film at all. Maybe I am the first hand, uh, the first person that they listen uh, to talk about Indonesian film. So they are film uh, students, <laughs> but they don't know a lot about Indonesian students, uh, sorry, Indonesian films. And when I um, describe about, about the data that I mentioned uh, in my presentation, they were surprised. They never, they never expected that Indonesian industry is the same as Italy, but they know Italy more than us. Mm. So that is the problem. Even they know Philippines and Thailand more than us. So what is the problem? I think the problem is the way we promote ourselves. We need to encourage ourselves and to filmmakers, maybe to academicians like me, to anyone, anyone or oh, cinephilia, uh, Indonesian cinephilia across the world, maybe uh, among the, uh, among the inter Indonesian students all over the world, uh, we need to promote Indonesian film more because I think it's worthy. It's worthy to promote. It, it is good enough, I think, compared to uh, like Nollywood or I don't, I don't want to um, understate their taste, but I think in the I mean, like the international standard, Indonesian film is quite good, I think. So we need to encourage ourselves to promote uh, Indonesian films. We need to challenge ourselves. <laughs> yeah. And I think most definitely, like, especially with the South Korea model, the more help we have from the government, then hopefully the easier that will also be for us to kind of put Indonesian cinema on the map. Um, but Edi, would you like to add anything or? Yeah, I mean, just a quick one that uh, I think that is something really important uh, if we talk about Indonesian film that travels abroad. And you have to know that every year, like when I was making postcard from the zoo was in competition at Berlinale at that time, 2012, like the number of Indonesian film that travels abroad is only less than three a year. So that means only one and two. Now it gets better, you know, less than five, meaning two or three films a year. So I think but but also we have to understand that to bring Indonesian films to international market means it's a different film. I mean, then it goes back to the contemporary Indonesia because what they want to see is the contemporary Indonesia, you know, what's going on there. Uh, you know, this, con this cultural contestation is something that they would want to see in a film. And, and these films are, you know, that, that, that would be able to travel abroad. And I always see festivals like the Olympics in sports, you know, you have a curated, uh, you have you have to be selected like kind of a curation to get into the Olympics and that's the same with film festival so I think like for Indonesian film also to get into there I think they really have to you know the quality has to be improved because I have to admit I've been you know doing this for quite some time 
it is different by you know having a film that really travels uh, Indonesian film that really travels abroad and the Indonesian film that really runs domestically you know with the big box office. Okay, thank you, Mbak Dede. We now have a question from uh, Tugu from YouTube. A question to all speakers. How's your perspective about Indonesian films in global contestations in the OTT media market? So global, uh, yeah, how's your perspective about Indonesian films and what we've been talking about with cultural contestations with streaming platforms, I guess. How, I guess, how different does it affect it? Because we have been talking a lot about feature films and cinema releases. How does it apply to OTT? Uh, I, I mean, I, I will answer. Uh, I mean, uh, I think the OTT, they are buying Indonesian films. I mean, if you look at Netflix, Disney Plus, they have a line up like a line up of Indonesian films and a lot of titles uh, are there. So you can actually access that uh, in, in these platforms, like the biggest one. But in terms of the industry itself at home in Indonesia, uh, I don't think like they are, we are yet uh, we are there yet. I mean, in terms that, for example, originals, you know, you know, the difference between, you know, like title with originals and then films that do the acquisition, like a normal buying. So I think if we are, we are not there yet in terms that there are not many yet Indonesian films that have, that has the label originals. I think so far there are only two, uh, Timos and Kimos film, and also another one is uh, Guru Guru Gokil, like just released just now. So I think if we more, if we have more on that, I think then OTT becomes, you know, uh, playing like a, a, a Im more important role. But at this moment, probably not yet there. Probably in three or five years. Okay. I think the the other thing as well uh, to add is uh, I think the good thing about like OTT in general is that is essentially like planting uh, seeds uh, in my opinion because you know it's not like a like a going to the cinema it's only there for like a few weeks it's literally unless it gets taken off it's there for forever right so you know even like uh, we had a, an event recently where we were discussing a, a couple of short Indonesian documentaries that had been sitting on YouTube for a while. Uh, so it's one of those things where as long as it's kind of there in the space, it, you know, the potential is there. So, that, you know, that's, that's the other side of it. But, you know, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I think according to my uh, previous research about Indonesian film audience, uh, more than half of the film, Indonesian film audience are prefer to go to the movie theater because that is a social event. Watching movie in the movie theater is social event. It's more important than the movie itself. So um, in, in my opinion, film culture in the Indonesian film society is not strong enough. If you want to expand this a film in Indonesian film industry to the foreign uh, uh, foreign audience, you need to make sure that the film culture is part of Indonesian uh, society. So we have like a audience base in the domestic market and we can expand into a foreign market. I think that's my answer. Thank you. Um, right, so next question from Hari Yadi. Why in Indonesia is film almost always considered as a tool for moral guidance? I think this is quite interesting. But at the same time, when a lot of people love a certain film, but when the film is criticized by others, film fans can say, oh, it's just a film. And this person, uh, Hari Yadi, references the case of Thilik, which was a, uh, which uh, the, the short film Thilik that was on YouTube that it went viral. Um, so yeah, why is why is it almost always that it's considered a tool for moral guidance in Indonesia? I had a research about that. Oh really? Excellent. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's kind of historical research about audience. It's, uh, it's modest research, and I, I find out that film was came uh, came to indonesia as um, entertainment for elite and after the independence uh, the medium 
become more democratic for common people. But at the same time, 90% of Indonesian people were illiterate. So that Ki Hajar Dewantara, you know him, uh, one of um, Indonesian founding fathers, uh, the education expert at the time, mentioned that film should serve as education tool for the illiterate person, people, because they couldn't read anything. They couldn't grab uh, the knowledge from books, uh, especially at that time, most of the knowledge book uh, in, in Dutch, not in Bahasa Indonesia. So he mentioned many times that uh, films could serve as education medium. It's follow uh, the Japanese, Japanese idea about the medium itself. Japanese use the medium as a propaganda medium. Yeah, so that's the idea came for. <laughs> and yeah. that's why the Western films do need to be education medium. <laughs> because <laughs> that's because they are not us. <laughs> well, this is where it becomes interesting, right? How much so is, I mean, you know, we're talking about something that was, this was established a very, very long time ago. How mm -hmm. much is it still perceived today that films should educate, Medina? Um, in my opinion, any medium can be served as education uh, medium, any medium, uh, newspaper, television, any kind can be served as an uh, education medium. Uh, in, it's depend on how the audience receive, receive the message, how the way they interpret the message. Yeah, uh, it's not only because of the content, but also because of the context. For example, if we, uh, our discussion today, maybe one who support the, the censorship may say that this discussion against the censorship, but for people who think censor is uh, quite important for, to protect the minor, they may, may think that this discussion try to revise how the censorship work and any kind. So uh, the, the way we understand the message in the medium, it's not only based on the text, but also the context that we have in our daily life. Okay, thank you. But Dede, do you want to do you want to jump in? Because maybe I'm just like sensitive, but I felt like the whole dialogue that I had that was supposedly going to be censored. That's education. That's sex education. <laughs> so, <laughs> but you know, what kind of education? But as a filmmaker, do you feel like your role is to educate? Yeah, I mean, that goes back to the idea of censorship, you know, like, you know, when you think that you are making a, a, a censorship, I mean, when you have a censorship and, you know, the burden of like the responsibility of the moral of the country in this one organization. And for me, that is not make sense. I mean, like, you cannot be the one who, you know, you know, like, be the only organization that that you know direct the moral of the country i mean that's not possible i mean especially in this era i mean that's that's too much of, of a burden for an organization and and that's why then it, it conflicts all the time but at the same time i would like to respond to madina about the kihajar Devantoro part i mean i didn't know about that but i mean the most that i remember is like for the longest time during orba uh film is under the ministry of communication for the longest time. So, I mean, that's also, I think one of the role, I mean, why film has to have a message. I mean, as a filmmaker, that's always come to me. What is the message of your film? Sometimes I feel like, do I have to have a message? And I mean, I know, I mean, I understand. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i okay with that question, but I feel like sometimes we forgot that when we make film, film is, as when we talk about film as a cultural product, it's an art, it's an artistic product. You have information and you have feelings. And, but sometimes we, we, we tend to, you know, kind of to take everything as an information. So that's why the question will be like, you know, what is the message of this film? But, but, you know, but then we tend to kind of neglect or we are not confident with our feelings, with our feelings. And sometimes we need confirmation from the filmmakers. So that's also the part that I feel like probably in that context, you know, film as a medium of expression 
it's not very well you know understand as as it is a film is it a, a medium of expression you know you have information and you have feeling and then sometimes it dif- it, it is different uh, between me and Mbak Dina, Hannah and Adrian and that's fine you know everyone has their own background that receives something in- differently so it does it I mean, film does not meant to be to have like one single message. I mean, that's something that I feel it really important for all of us. Yeah, I think I think it can be a bit misleading as well because yes, films can shine a light onto you know things that we weren't aware of before. But ultimately, it's the responsibility of the audience member. You know how how much they let it sort of educate them in some ways. You know, it's not purely the responsibility of the filmmaker. We have to sort of um, you know, give a, a bit of, uh, you know, respect and responsibility to the other side as well, right? Definitely. Right. Thank you, guys. Uh, one more question. This is from um, Eno. Uh, maybe, Adrian, you could perhaps help out with this, being a London-based um, filmmaker. I'd like to know how the UK censorship works in terms of cultural, religious or sexuality issues. Um, so in the UK, we've got the... Uh, British Board of Film Classification, uh, I believe, which is basically a, a board which will review films and, um, yeah, essentially give a, uh, yeah, a certificate uh, uh, based on the, uh, the how mature the themes are, uh, I guess. In terms of specifically, you know, re- religious-based things, it's a hard one to give a comment on because there isn't, really as much of a you know film religious sort of culture here so um I, I i'm not sure how much of that actual content they would need to censor but i think you know generally speaking it would have to be something you know really uh, severe for something to get you know badly you know censored you know promoting killing or you know something like that but dina do you perhaps um in your studies at university of nottingham do you perhaps have a have anything to add on this? I don't know if you've done comparative studies on the um, censorship board here. I know, I don't think so, but I, I, in my readings, I found that Indonesian censorship is outdated. Titik, <laughs> as simple as that. <laughs> Brilliant, <laughs> okay. Right, in that case, we'll move on to the next question. Um, this is from Shandi. As a regular audience, I feel somehow it's getting harder to get entertained or simply to understand Indonesian films. Oh, this is interesting. The quality, the storytelling, et cetera, is getting weaker and behind compared to other Asian films. This is very unfortunate. Is this the result of the film industry as a whole? What, 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 is, the, what is the reason behind this? Is it the film industry's failure, failure to compete with social media? Oh, this is quite interesting, the link with social media. I think this is an interesting point because it's because in Indonesia there are a lot of people. I don't know, my daddy, if you feel this as well, but when we try to promote our films and they're like, "Oh, Indonesian films aren't good," we're like, "Indonesian films are amazing." When was the last time you watched one? But there is this idea that, "Oh, film Indonesia kurang bagus." It's yeah, it's okay. And I guess this is what perhaps Shandi feels that the quality of the films are not always great. So what? I mean, it's it's difficult because everyone. I get everyone determines quality and the strength of films differently, but um, do you have anything to perhaps, um, do you have any answers for her, my lady, maybe? Well, I think, uh, I think, I think uh, it depends on which film. I mean, I agree not all, all of Indonesian films are quality, of course. I mean, uh, there are the bad ones, I have to say, but I mean, it depends on which one you watch the film. And I think you have to dig more. I have. I think you have to find more, like the independent Indonesian, for example. Have you watched City, for example? Have you watched Have you watched Kuchumbu, for example? Have you watched the short films like uh, like uh, the Fox that get into Cannes, uh, Prinjak that gets into Cannes, uh, Mariam that gets into Venice, for example? So I think you you have to know. I mean, it's the same with other industry. If I look at the UK's films, I mean, if you only like see the big one of course the big one they also have the good one but then you have to look also at the independence you you know of Brit, british independent films and then you have so much more different than the one that you see in the mainstream for example so i think uh yeah i think you just need to look more uh for the titles don't you think 
Yeah, yeah it's, it's always going to be a, a, a subjective on that. But I think, you know, like you say, I think it's actually been quite a strong decade for Indonesian cinema, you know, you yeah. know arguably, objectively the strongest when you look at, you know, the international successes that you touched on, like Marlena as well. You know, yeah. Can even you know, a film like The Raid, you know, exploding in the way that it did over here. So, yeah, I, there are signs that it's on the up. And I think that might be, you know, just to su support my own theory that because it's becoming easier to make films, so more talent is having the opportunity to actually do that, I think, than before. Yeah. Right, thank you. Uh, next question. This one's quite interesting because it looks at um, government sponsorship of films. So this is from Bruce. Uh, speaking of Indonesian government sponsorship of films, we had an example recently of a film that gained notoriety because of its filmmaker and hokey story. I'm not sure which one uh, Bruce is referring to, but um, how can related ministries choose worthwhile films to sponsor and make a difference? Or how perhaps someone could offer some insight into how the ministries are helping, are, are like our ministries in Indonesia allowed to fund commercial films? Is that even something that is allowed? Perhaps someone can offer some insight on that? Uh, what, 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 what film? Which film? Um, so basically the question is about Indonesian ministries funding films. And uh -huh. one film that was mentioned was uh, described by Bruce as hokey story. And the filmmaker became quite notorious. Sempat agak viral di Indonesia. About Bali. I haven't, so that, I haven't yet watched it either, but maybe, but maybe we can, um, yeah, discuss the involvement of ministries funding films, perhaps. Um, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I haven't seen the, the, the film, so I don't know, uh, yeah, that one, but. I mean, it has been quite some time, uh, you know, the ministry. I mean, before I remember, before uh, there are number of films that sponsored by the ministry, for example. But it, it is always tricky. I mean, if you receive a money from, from the state money, especially if you get from the ministry, that means you get a state money. And when you get a state money for film production, then you have to know exactly like who owns the rights. Because uh, with the with the state money, if I'm not mistaken, uh, then it should be it should belong to the government. If you are funded by uh, state money, APBN, yeah, uh, then it has to belong to the to the government, and that means you lose your you know your your rights on the films, you, you lose your control on the films. I remember like years ago back then, um, there is a feature film funded by the ministry. And at the end of the uh, at the end of the production, the film cannot go to the to, to the cinema because they say if it's funded by the ministry, you cannot go commercial on it. And meaning literally cannot screen it in the cinema because with cinema that means you have revenue and that means commercial. So I think this perspective, I mean, aside that this perspective has to be also like question. I mean, it's kind of outdated in terms of IP rights and everything. But at the same time, you have to be very careful like receiving money from the government for a production that's from what I, my knowledge okay but Dina do you have anything to add perhaps on um, the involvement of ministries as investors in films yeah I had an experience related to a government funded uh, films production because I'm I am one of the curators of uh, film production program in Yogyakarta province as part of what you call it, Idana Kestimewaan, a special grant from the central government to the province government. Uh, they established a kind of competition to provide funding for the short film production. One of, the, one of them is still, maybe some of you watched the movie that viral uh, several months ago. So in that scheme, uh, the government give money to the filmmaker to produce uh, short movies. And after that, both of the party, uh, government and the filmmakers have rights to distribute the movie as long as it's not commercial purposes. So the movie uh, is screening in the film festival 
uh, special screening, micro cinema, uh, mobile theater, mobile mobile screening, and something like that. And and uh, uh, and of course uh, social media also like the the deleted. So I think uh, maybe compared to others grants that uh, similar with that, uh, the Yogyakarta government doesn't have any intention to make the program into as a public relation program or promotion pro promotional program. The program intention is to improve the capability of the filmmakers to improve the quality of the production. So I think if the central government want to adapt uh, the scheme, the logic behind the scheme and also the procedure, I think it will be beneficial. Okay, thank you, Medina. Um, and one more question from the Flanders. Although more recent Indonesian films are now becoming available outside Indonesia via platforms such as Netflix, is there any prospect of seeing older films such as Down the Atas Bantal or Lovely Man re-released on these platforms as they are often quoted as being some of the best of Indonesian cinema? And of course, there should be an audience for them. I don't know who, um, I don't know who, none of the filmmakers of these films are here, but um, how much, how much is it? Uh, I mean, or perhaps Madeda, you could offer some insight as to how, um, films are picked up in other regions perhaps because I know I mean I've been happy enough to be able to watch some of the Indonesian films um here through Netflix but I know that obviously the content is much smaller than what you would have in the Indonesian region for example so how much is there an effort to to secure um other regions as well as Indonesia from Indonesian filmmakers yeah uh, it really it really depends on the filmmakers. I mean, it really depends on the producers. Then, for example, and or who owns the films now. For example, down is down the Atas Bantal is really in the nineties, so I don't know like whether the producer still has it or like it changed to someone else. For example, sometimes it happens, so it really has to go back to the producers. But I think uh, many of the producers are trying to you know give like a bulk. Uh, of their slate of film for you know backdated to to the OTT because that's the idea to really reconnect the audience with their old titles for example so I think um, probably with the titles that you mentioned uh, it I mean we have to ask with the producers of that of that films but the idea of it I mean I would want to have that too because I even want want to see like the old movies of Indonesia and I don't know where to go then to, to watch that. I mean like I'm talking about the 50, even 60s, 70s films. So and as far as I know the I mean we have Cinematic, but I don't know if they are the but I think they are not the rights owner. I mean they are just as a library to keep the film. So that's the best answer that I can give you. <laughs> Maybe uh, we'll have to place our hopes in Adrian and IFS to secure yes. um, to yeah. secure these uh, the rights to distribute these in the UK, so we can have more screenings and see even more Indonesian films in the UK. Adrian, yeah. got it? No, no pressure, then. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> right. Well, I think that's the end of our uh, Q and A discussion. I just want to ask each of the panelists if you have any closing remarks, perhaps. But Dina, mungkin. Oh, you're on mute, but Dina. Okay. Or was that a no? I don't have anything to say. <laughs> I couldn't tell. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, although we discuss a lot about censorship, that we need to pay attention also for persecution. Uh, the government is responsible to stop the persecution to guarantee democracy and legal system in Indonesia. Yeah, we, yeah, a part of uh, all the demand of the filmmakers about the in financial incentive and so on, and uh, the persecution also uh, the important issue that we need to tackle. Thank you, Magdina. By the day? Well, I think uh, I'm, I'm really happy as a filmmaker in this period and in this time. And 
I do believe that there, there will be more uh, interesting artistically uh, Indonesian films that coming. I do believe that the talents of Indonesian filmmakers is getting more and more. And yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I'm excited to be part of it. And uh, there are many obstacles, of course, but not only film industry has many obstacles, like every industry has many obstacles. But I think that's something also that, that you know, uh, motivate us to move forward and also there are always a way to 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 survive and you know to to still uh, able to make what we want so I, I think I look forward to the future then especially to do screening with Adrian then yay so Adrian any last closing remarks and confirmation of which films that you'll be showing next thank you <laughs> <laughs> mine, mine, mine. My, my closing remark is giving uh, about dead and my phone number by the sounds of it but, uh, <laughs> brilliant <laughs> Uh, no, I, I want to, well, f firstly, I just want to say thank you to everyone here, you know, to people who've tuned in, to my fellow panelists, uh, the Indonesian Embassy and Adipud, you know, for this uh, this collaboration. I think it's been, you know, really insightful, uh, despite me being part of the panel. Uh, so, um, but yeah. I mean, excellent. <laughs> well, in terms of, yeah, the, the Indonesian Film Society, you know, we're going to, you know, try to keep the fight going. You know, it's, it's, it's clearly... Uh, a uh, challenging time but you know pandemic or not I think people still want to be entertained uh, and you know Ind Indonesia still has uh, a million things to, to talk about so yeah we'll, yeah we'll try to keep that going. Thank you Adrian so I think I think I speak for everyone when you know I say that we hope the industry will bounce back from this pandemic and we'll have an even brighter future and we can't wait to see more Indonesian films and yeah, uh, thank you so much for this amazing discussion. Thank you to everyone who asked questions. Thank you to Mbak Dina, um, Mbak Dede, to Mas Adrian, and also to the Office of the Education and Culture Attaché of the Indonesian Embassy, His Excellency Pak Desra Percaya, Indonesian Ambassador to the UK and Ireland. Um, just to let everyone know that um, thank you very much also to Indonesian Film Society. And if you want to keep track of any discussions or any screenings that they have, you can follow them on Instagram at Indonesian Film Society. And if you'd like to have any updates at all on events or anything to do with Indonesia in the UK, you can follow Indonesia in London for the Indonesian Embassy's Instagram. So uh, I'm Hannah Al-Rashid. Peace out to all of you. Thank you so much for this amazing discussion. It's been a pleasure to talk with you all. And I'm going to pass you back to Pak Arif. Terima kasih. Terima kasih semuanya. I think we'll need to lip read Pak Arif's uh, closing remarks by the looks of it. <laughs> Silakan, Pak Arif. Ah, okay. Hello, can you hear me now? Right. Yes, we can um, hear you, Pak. Thank you. Uh, so I would like to um, really uh, express my gratefulness to everybody especially Pak Tisra, who spared time to give speech, uh, remarks, and then uh, the three speakers, Mas Adrian, and then Mbak Dina and uh, Mbak Dede, and also Mbak Hanna here. Yeah? Thank you very much for this very, very interesting and exciting um, um, occasions. I, because initially our, our um, I'll say, our uh, intention is just to have a discussion, but it turns out to be very fruitful and productive and you know very interesting discussion. So I would be very grateful to all of you. So hopefully this is not the, the, the only time we can meet and share uh, ideas. Hopefully we can just make uh, you know like a future project, hopefully more concrete, more uh, maybe we can probably like produce a film about maybe about Batisla's uh, career or any underscore in the you know in the diplomacy, <laughs> so it's like you know I was I just mentioned one about about the you know like the the social mobility of an Indonesian from Indonesia to UK and become like you know somebody great or big. <laughs> so, so thank you very much, everybody. Yeah, thank you.
I did it. Okay. Well, for me, it's lunchtime. So bye, everyone. <laughs> Bahana, someone told me that you speak French. Uh, yes, I do. I'm, uh, yeah. Are, are, we, are we finished, by the way? Is it still? <laughs>